Welcome to With All Due Respect. This is a podcast for women over 40 who are looking for sane, frank advice about their health and wellness, especially through and after menopause. I'm Amanda Thieb, a personal trainer and nutrition coach and the author of the best-selling book, Menopocalypse, how I learned to thrive during menopause and how you can too. I'd love you to join me every week as I chew the fat with some fab guests on hot topics that directly impact you. I also know the power of conversation is lost and there's nothing better than sitting down for a natter with your mate and putting the world to rights. And that's exactly what I'll be doing with this podcast. We'll really get to know my guests, what's and all. I've made it my mission to help you by exploding a few myths and presenting you with plain, simple facts. These inspiring conversations will hopefully empower you to be a healthy, strong, resilient bitch, you know, just like me. Before we get started, don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a review and then visit me at amandatheeb.com. And now let's get started on today's show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to this week's episode of With All Due Respect. This week, I am joined by Anka Griffiths, who is the CEO of OM. I have become involved with the company OM, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, what the company stands for and the work that they do. A little bit about Anka, though. Her company was born out of her own personal experiences after attempting to navigate the health market on three separate continents. Actually, that's exactly the same as me, to be truthful. And it showed her the immense opportunity for credible and engaging health support that brings precision medicine to the general public. The three continents and the three places she's lived are Canada, yeah, Canada, go Canada, France and Asia. And she's now based out of Switzerland. Is that correct, Anka? Switzerland and Hong Kong, yeah. Hong Kong, yeah. We, I know you as being in a Hong Kong. So welcome to the show. But let's talk a little bit about OM and sort of what it stands for, because I think people are going to get a little bit excited about today's episode. I mean, I think maybe if you could start from like a three-pronged approach to OM, like who are the three different categories of people that would benefit from your company? Well, so good to be here, Amanda. Thank you so much. So my background is not at all in health and wellness. I'm Canadian. Shortly after finishing business university in Canada, I moved to Paris and I started working for the luxury sector. Now, I was in the luxury world from the time before luxury was online to, you know, luxury brands accepting that they can put products online and people will buy, you know, a $3,000 handbag online. They'll buy watches and jewelry online if you know how to do it well and if you're legitimate in what you're presenting. I started working in Paris. I was there for six years and then I moved to Asia and I've been in Asia for about Oh, 12 years now. <laughs> and so I wasn't really thinking of shifting. It was really, yes, you're right from my personal experience, which was postpartum. So as you know, many women, I, I was very well read on the pregnancy, on the delivery process. And then when I went home with the baby, I was, you know, so shocked by how uninformed I was about my postpartum journey. And I thought, well, how can this be? You know, I'm, I'm Canadian. I've lived in Europe. Here I am in Asia. I have access online to any kind of information. I'm an informed consumer. I care. How did I not know about this? And around the same time, you know, Kardashians were having babies. And I think it was Chrissy Teigen as well who had her, her first child. And she said, oh, I didn't know we'd be going home in diapers too. And then everybody picked it up as, oh, they're dropping truth bombs about postpartum. And I thought, like, how is this a truth bomb? You know, how is such a basic thing that happens during postpartum something that we don't know about that catches us by surprise? So then I, you know, kind of put my old hat back on, which was, you know, analyzing markets, analyzing trends. And I looked at actually what are we exposed to online when it comes to health and wellness? And I thought, well, actually, where are the experts online? Where is the one place that I can go to to find the best of health experts and the information and support that they're offering? So I thought, well, it's kind of exciting because it doesn't exist. So I'm going to build that. I'm going to, you know, create a company that brings together the best minds in health. 
I knew, and this was pre-COVID, I knew that it, this needed to be international because after living in France, I noticed that, you know, the French system supported health in a certain way, which was really interesting. Asia also has certain other things that are, are interesting to look at. U.S., of course, with Canada. So it, I needed to pull from where they were. What I didn't expect <laughs> was what happened once I brought the experts on board and once I accessed what they had to say and the knowledge that they had. And that's when I realized, you know, how incredibly uninformed and misled we are in the journey that, you know, we're engaging with in our health. So I think it was in this process that we met because you wrote your amazing book that I find just perfect in every way to talk about, you know, midlife health and to support women to, in a very, as I say, balanced approach, but empowering them with information coming from a health expert. So I wanted to have, you know, your voice and on, on our platform. Well, actually, so, that's essentially how I got involved is because I have done some speaking with OM via Anchor as well. And so, yeah, and so, 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 so that's it, right? So you, you bring in health expert to give informed information, workshops, educational classes, um, and you help support corporate clients with their employees and to be able to give them real informed, complete health for, you know, female, female health, sorry. And obviously the consumer, the consumer benefits. So they're the three sort of like legs that you work with. Absolutely. But one of the things that attracted me to your model, and we definitely have the same values, and I think that's part of it. Like we are both sort of sitting in the middle going, what's happening in women's health here? What what on earth is happening? I mean, I can pull back from what you said in the beginning, how you previously worked in luxury goods. I feel like women's health has become a luxury good. It's come, become part of that component. I mean, it's become a conversation of like the privileged and all the supplements and all of the gimmicks that they try and how they, like the Kardashians or the Tegans, feel like they're the ones with the truth bombs. And and part of me is like, no, no, let's just pull this back. That's not how women's health works at all. It doesn't need to be expensive. It needs to be accessible to all. There are so, so economic limitation and boundaries on women's health that you actually try and dig deep and get dirty in, right? Have you seen that then when you've been doing your analysis of like market trends and, and women's health? Have you seen this sort of like real great divide? Or is it just me? Like no, waving no, a flag no. in the middle, going, what it, the hell? You know, from again, my background not in health, it's in business. And let's look at it from a business perspective. The numbers don't add up. So quickly after starting this journey, I met two amazing doctors, Dr. Allison McGregor and Dr. Marjorie Jenkins, who are now part of OM. And through them and through the book that Alison McGregor wrote, Sex Mattered, I discovered the male-centric medical system. Again, fell down this rabbit hole of, so you mean in the past hundred years, all medicine has been studied on male bodies and applied to women? And the, there's consequences behind that. So let's look at this number. 80% of medications taken off of the market are because they have negative side effects in women. Yet, 80% of medications in the U.S. are purchased by women. So the numbers actually don't add up. Women are different to men in their approach to health. They're a lot more proactive. They're, they are the early adapters of trends. Yet the information that's coming at us, because it's not coming at us most of the time through health experts like yourself, like others who represent subjects because they've studied them, because they've seen patients, because they understand the market. It's coming at us from either people who are passionate about something or people who are trying to push a product. We are constantly either lacking information or misinformed. So that's what really shocked me, the potential of you know what this could be if we bring the right information and the right support to women. Yeah. <laughs> 
and it's and it's yeah it's really great food for thought there like this male centric medicine system i do think things are changing slightly but we also do know that women phys- on a physiological level respond differently to different stimuli whether that be drugs exercise or food whatever right um and if if we know that a uh, a lot of the medications that are prescribed to us haven't really been thoroughly tested on a female market. That's sort of concerning for us, right? But even if we, like, even if that change is coming and even if it's happening as we speak, we do know that we inherited patriarchal um, medical system globally. It seems to be like that around the world. Female doctors, scientists are all speaking up now. It's fantastic. I love it. We demand more and we should continue to keep demanding more. And But I feel like one of the reasons you call it the predatory wellness industry has, and I do too, <laughs> I call it wellness wankery, as you know, but like the, the, <laughs> predatory, the predatory wellness industry has exploded and been allowed to be as big as it is now is because of, for me, some of the limitations on this inherited or poorly, yeah, this inherited male-centric medic- medical system. It's almost like I hear the term, you know, well, Western medicine failed me, so therefore it's all broken. And so therefore I'm only going to go down on the woo train, right? Yeah, no, absolutely not. So I, what you said at first absolutely is true. So uh, Dr. Alison McGregor, Dr. Marjorie Jenkins, yourself, there's so many that are changing the system from inside. They're advocating for more women to get put on studies. They are training doctors. They're raising awareness. Are we at you know a perfect level? No, we're not. But they are dedicating their careers to this. From here, there's a second part where us as consumers, and I'm, you know, I'm a consumer, not a health expert, we need to meet them halfway. We need to also search for this information and work with the health experts and listen to them. So we meet them halfway because when we're empowered with that kind of information, it's not about saying Western medicine is not for me, but it's about asking the right questions at the right time and kind of knowing how to judge have a good conversation with your healthcare practitioner. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly that, right? So the meeting the halfway thing is I feel like something that you and I do in the bridging the gap type messages that we do and the education and support and community that we try and foster, like in women's health. But, you know, when it comes to people being misled with compelling and I think toxic sort of marketing like what's your what are your thoughts on that like you 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 do have feelings when it comes to non-experts and experts who have products to sell right so how as consumers do we navigate that world because here's the thing like you see me all the time I'm always calling out the bs on um on Instagram. And whenever I see these ads, I just repost my Instagram, like take and get blocked all the time, but I don't care. But when it comes to things like products that tell women, like it's going to like zap their belly fat, or it's going to remove their, you know, it's going to fix their adrenal fatigue or any, you name it, it's out there. But when a woman isn't feeling herself and she really doesn't know which way to turn and there's something compelling that reaches out to her, like it, I completely understand the pull. I understand yeah. the draw in towards that. But how as consumers do we navigate that? I mean, what are your thoughts? I mean, I don't think there's a, an easy answer to this. I'm trying not to put you on the spot too much. No, there definitely isn't an easy answer. And I think most of the health experts that are joining OM are it's for two reasons. One, they are so frustrated to see men and women being taken advantage of in these points in their health journey. And they wish they would have been able to educate them early and to educate them in how to understand their bodies, how to understand the market so that they don't get to this point. But unfortunately, you know, the power today with social media and key opinion leaders, the power has shifted away from these healthcare professionals and experts into a lot of the times the hands of non-experts. And why is that? Again, looking at it, at the market and just analyzing it because they look great, because they allow themselves to, you know, make over promising claims. And whereas a doctor or 
you know, somebody that has medical licenses many of the times will never do it, something like that. So I think two things. One, you know, that's our raison d'etre. That's why we exist. OM2. For me, when I look at a health expert coming on board, one, are they accredited in the field that they're supporting men or women in? Have they, do they have experience interacting with patients in this? And two, even if they're a health expert, are they pushing a product? So because a lot of the times when you're pushing a product, all of the recommendations that you do seem to equal take this product, <laughs> you know, whereas yourself and all of other the other health experts that we have, it's always, it depends. It depends on your, you know, age, it depends on your health situation. It depends, it depends. And then lastly, which is something that we, nobody tells us to do, but what does your body tell you? Right. When you're listening to, you know, somebody talk about intermittent fasting or a certain exercise routine and you try it, and you're suffering, you're, you know, you're not sleeping well, you're moody, you're feeling bad. Instead of saying to ourselves, oh, well, this must not be working out for me. Well, I remember because that's the same thing I used to say. We say, oh, I'm too weak. I need to get over this hump. I'm too weak. I can't do it or I failed. But we never say, well, maybe that wasn't right for me or what silly advice that actually didn't work. We, we judge ourselves. What the health experts say, and this is whether you're a doctor, traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, strength coach, what they say is, if it works for you, your body will tell you. But we're never taught to look internally anymore because we're taught, you know, this is it, like, come to come here. This is the solution. And if you're strong enough, it'll work for you. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's um, really so interesting because that was the talk that I did with you, wasn't it? Like how to become your own best detective, like how to learn to truly understand your body. And you made a really great point there because when somebody promises something with a one size fits all, it's already a red flag in my opinion, because we understand how unique the body is and how nuanced it is, whether that's from talking about hormone therapy, which you and I have had long conversations conversations about. It definitely mm -hmm. shouldn't be sold or promoted as a one size fits all because that just does a disservice to all the women that can't take it or don't want to take it. All you know, right down to the supplement side, to the other side of it, like the big supplement industry is mm -hmm. just as bad, right? So we need to be very mindful of the conversations. And, you know, you, you made a really great point. And that was, um, you know, the doctors aren't the one putting out the curated feed, like showing you how good you could look and how well you could be. And here's me, here's what I eat every day. And this is what I take every day. And this is what I look like. Because they're too busy doing their bloody jobs, yeah. right? They don't have time to be doing social mm -hmm. media posts. And so, Definitely. Like, I, I think that just there's enough people like you and I out there that are talking really openly about that. Also saying, I fell for it too. Don't worry. I'd say to women, it's okay to just stop and just ask the questions, you know, is this too good to be true? No. And you know what? It, so there's many, many different things that you can tap into and you should. And we're, you know, this is obviously when you're looking at optimal health, not when you're actually dealing with a problem where you need to find the right health practitioner for, but, you know, I, I suffer from migraines. I've tried many things from acupuncture to traditional Chinese medicine to, you know, osteopathy to, and some things work for me and some things don't, but it doesn't mean that if it works for me, it will work for everybody else. It doesn't mean that if it doesn't work for me, it won't work for somebody else. So, and even with other types of support like traditional Chinese medicine, because we have practitioners in this too, you need to understand your body, how it works, why you're doing it. And that component will allow you to take an informed decision whether you want to do it or not. And, and then from there, what does your body tell you? <laughs> you know? You know, I was really interested about the traditional Chinese medicine because it's not my wheelhouse. It's not something I've, I have an interest in. I know it's something that doesn't have robust studies behind it because it's a traditional practice. Like I, you know, like, so I understand like, but I understand a lot of people are, are drawn towards it. When we did the conversation with the traditional Chinese medicine, I just listened to how she spoke and I just was like blown away by it. It was such a different. And I, by the way, our conversation that we did was around menopause. And the traditional Chinese medicine practitioner came on, medicine practitioner came on, 
actually just talked about how we approach menopause and how we view it through our the lens of getting older. And it was so refreshing and it was so impactful. Like it left me thinking afterwards. I know that the Chinese call menopause the second spring. Even that's better. But like it was just the way that like it was almost like giving ourselves permission to have trust in our body, to to not fight against a biological process that's happening, to respect our body, to revere how it's going to make us be and feel when we go through the process. And so that was what I took away from that. And I thought, like, and, and even the studies support, like just the experiences that women go through in different countries and Asia being one of them is a more positive experience Mm-hmm. than the Western experience of menopause. And I wonder whether it's really a lot, a lot of it is down to how they speak about it as well. There's two things. It's how women's health is viewed, definitely. And, but the second thing is preventative care. And so I think you and I often speak about this. And so we work a lot with companies that are now interested in supporting women through menopause because they're looking at numbers and especially out of England, numbers are coming in that women during midlife are suffering to the point where they can't do their job well. So they're like, oh my God, let's bring in support. And so then when they do that, they're mostly thinking, I'm going to support women 50 years old plus. But we know, speaking with the experts, but I wouldn't have known this again unless I met with you and other experts. Menopause is not click 50, you need to do something about it. It's you need to understand this in your late 30s. It doesn't mean that you're menopause in menopause, but it means you're shifting into that transition. And even the word, the minute I say menopause, women did like shut off their minds because, oh, I'm not there yet. Thank God I'm 48. I'm not there yet. <laughs> You're like, well, so the challenge is how do we in a preventative way support women, but how do we get women to hear about this? Because what Gigi was saying, who's a traditional Chinese doctor, is because there's this already understanding in Asia that menopause needs to be supported and you need to support your body and being strong at this time, women will go in earlier to see her, right? So again, if this is traditional Chinese medicine or it's somebody adapting their sports routine or even having a different conversation with their health practitioner, this is the difference. Um, You know, it's preventative care versus, okay, now it's broken. What do we do about it? The other thing is that, yes, they call it the second spring, but they also look at women's health as not better, not worse, but different and more complex. More complex because there's shifts, right? They have the the menstrual cycle shift. We have fertility if we choose. We have um, menopause and the menopause shift. And so, as you know, the philosophy is where's their shift? There's more likely of a chance to be an imbalance. How do we support women in that? And so they have targeted care and support for that, which includes mental health, right? They don't discount mental health. So that's the thing. So again, whether you go to traditional Chinese medicine or not, that's not the point. The point is the philosophy behind it that I like. Yeah, it was, fact, it, it was so great. It, like it was a bit of a light bulb moment to me because I do want to talk to you about this as well. And it's it was listening to Gigi talk, I was just like, it was so respectful. I just, it was just a different dynamic and it wasn't menopause. I'm going to roll my eyes and pretend it hasn't happened. It was like, yeah, we're already aware of it. We respect it. And this is how we can support women. And the first way we support them is by having this open conversation. And, you know, it it was, I really was quite, I really was impressed with, you know, her approach to it. But it sort of ties in with something that we discuss often, and it's the negative rhetoric. And I don't even just mean around menopause, but changes, changes and challenges that women have in our health space. And so can you sort of talk a little bit about that and what you've seen from the work you're doing and... No, it's, what it's we one have. of my favorite subjects. So, <laughs> um, right now, OM is a precision medicine company because we, well, there's a huge need for women's health, and the gap is there. And as I said, there's 
possibly more unique opportunities for women to support their health in their milestones. You can't do that without men's health, right? So if you're looking at fertility, there's male side, female side, and so on with every subject, including midlife. But when I started OM, it was purely women's health. And I thought, when you look at women's health, it jumps off the page. Like the numbers just jump off the page and how badly we're doing, you know, 70% more likely to have the diagnosed with depression, 50% pelvic floor incontinence. Ah. And so I thought, oh my God, this is so good. I have created a platform that supports women in these health matters. I am going to talk to companies and say, look, 50% of your, what percent of your, your um, employees are female. Look at what we can do together. And I found a really interesting thing when I started doing that, which was I was meeting with men in these, depart- the, these departments presenting the different information. They'd say, oh, this is very interesting. Let's see how, you know, let's explore this. When I was talking to women and I said, ta-da, women's health support for women's health specific matters, they would brush me off. I'd say, you know, Mom, this year we're focusing on mental health. I'm not so sure about this. And I thought, well, what is happening? Like, you know, I thought it would be so easy. And then I realized, no, 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 wait. I worked in a corporate environment for 13, 14 years. If somebody would have come to me and would have said, okay, Anka, you're a female. And because you're a female, you have special health needs. And so I have this support that I'm going to come to you. And I'm going to support your needs during this, these times. I would have said like, I don't know, can we swear on the show? But I would have said like, no, thank you. I don't need support because of my fragile female body. I'm fine. I'm, you know, the same. I'm the same as men. I don't need extra support for this. So this is what I was experiencing. And what we need to keep in mind is that, you know, for since the dawn of time, we've been told that our female bodies are less than, they're weaker, they're emotional. And then we added hormonal. Oh, no, we're hysterical. Oh, we're... And so in a fight to integrate in the workforce and to become equal, we've completely dissociated ourselves from any of that. Because can you think of a positive word to associate with menopause? Can you think of a positive word to associate with menstrual cycle, with postpartum, with anything that is specifically female? Can you think of positive notions that come along with it? And you can't, right? So we don't want to be that. We want to, we don't want to deal with that or be that. And so this is what I was seeing. And I realized that the work needs to be, you know, well, let's just say it's not as easy as to just say here support. It's okay. Well, how do we actually get women to hear this? How do, how do we do this without the pushback because of all the reasons you've just said? How do we, how do we get there without driving the fact that menopause is going to break them down? Because that's what we're hearing, right? So. Yeah. And, and it's look, not the message we want to get across either, right? Not because to be fair, they're okay. If you look at men's aging, you can pull many negative things as well, right? Because after 35, their brain slows down and blah, blah, blah. Sure. It's a lot less intense and di- very different to women, but you can also look at it and you're just looking at aging, <laughs> right? There's that side to it. There's the side of you need to understand why might or might not happen. So you're not shocked by it because what most women say when I work with them on the subject and we look at menopause, they're like, I wish I knew this seven years ago. I wish I knew this 10 years ago. Again, but the challenge is seven years ago, you'd have never listened. Exactly. It's exactly so, that. So then um, we also need to, and I work and you do this wonderfully. I work with every health expert to say, okay, there is empowering women with that information because this is what's going to happen, could happen. But what's also the positive side to it? Because there's so many positive sides to it. Let's not forget that too, right? And integrate that into the discussion. Because first, you try to dissociate yourself with something that's completely negative. And two, if we have nothing to look forward to, to appreciate in our bodies in whatever moment we're looking at, then of course, we're not going to value the feminine, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like amazing. For you, for you what do you think one of the major things that's positive about this transition beyond just being a rock star advocate? <laughs> uh-huh. well, there are very, there are many in my opinion, but I sort of, 
I'm just going to pull back a little bit and then answer that. And one of the things that, and by the way, this is my podcast, not yours, Anka. <laughs> I get to ask the questions, not you. But seriously, when I was 38, 40, I didn't even need to hear the word menopause because it didn't feel like it was on my radar. It wasn't tangible. It didn't. Why would I even have that conversation when I was 42 and I was side swiped with it? And there was no information. It took years before I found out what that was causing my issues, right? So it was then I was like, well, why didn't anybody tell me? And I was like, well, oh, it's because I didn't want to listen, right? And then during the time about six to eight years where I was struggling a lot with perimenopause, especially from the mental health side, there was never a day where I woke up and said, this feels positive to me. Mm. And so sometimes when you talk about the positives of menopause, even that's complicated because it, you don't want to come across as it being this toxic positivity. It has to be a respectful yeah. way. And so like how I've tried to frame my conversation is, listen, we know that for a lot of women, when we know the numbers, like 75% of women will have a menopause experience that presents lots of symptoms and 25% of women will have them that alter their quality of life, but not all women, right? So we have to talk about all women as well. But when we know that it's a transition, it's called the menopause transition for a reason, because our bodies are really smart. They learn to adapt. They learn to rebound our brain. We know our brain can cope with postmenopause. And so I'm now like three or four years postmenopause and thinking, I feel really good. Is it okay for me to say that? Is it sort of, sort of, I don't know, radical to say, I feel really good? Or is it going to piss everybody off? Like it's this fine balance, isn't it, Anchor, of like saying what feels good and what doesn't, and are we allowed to say? But one of the most amazing things that's come out of menopause for me is just that I feel like it's, I don't want to sound too cheesy and uh, Glenn and Doyle here, but like we can do hard things. And it was just one of those experiences. It was one of the single most challenging things I've been through for an extended chronic period of time that I've got through the other side and I'm starting to re reclaim my own narrative. And that's what we want for women. Mm -hmm. And so like I'm starting to show women that they can do new things, new jobs, new hobbies. They can believe in their athletic ability. They can have an opinion. They can speak their mind. They don't have to people please all the time. There's like this freedom that comes and it's, I imagine a freedom that comes with age as well. I always used to like look at my grandma and think, oh my God, she just does what she wants and says what she wants and nobody's offended by her. They just think it's awesome. And yeah. I think that that's the, one of the positives that, that's come out of it for me, but I'm very aware of the road it took to get there. And that's mm -hmm. what I always try and talk about when I talk about menopause is I get it, right? I get yeah. No, I mean, it, again, it's such a com complex subject. That's the thing that I find, you know, fascinating, challenging. And th with this, it's not so easy as to just present something and then go with it because there's so many, many layers to it. But I think one is when we understand biologically what happens, we, it's not that it becomes easier, but you don't have that sense of being lost. And you can try to find solutions that might work for you in the moment. And I'm going to go back to, you know, with the subject that started at all, which is, you know, kind of the same thing for everything, but it's postpartum, right? When you look at a postpartum experience, it's, you know, it's like you're hit by a bus. <laughs> but if you understand in the first four hours, hormones does this, these hormones that just kind of drop through the floor might lead to this shifts in this might lead to anemia, not sleeping might lead to the, when you put that into perspective, one, you understand and respect your body for what it's going through. And you're kinder to yourself, right? Versus, okay, 
clearly I'm tired and weak and I'm going to try to do something to pull myself out of this. And when we try to pull ourselves out of situations, a lot of the times we cause more harm again, because we try these, you know, sensationalized diets or. And then we fall quick, hard and, and then, we yeah. feel like every like we failed. It's a, a, it's sort of like something that we see all the time. It's like this circle, isn't it? Like we see this, it compounds the problem. So yeah. to me, the basic of it is let's rely on health experts that have the information to understand what our bodies are going through. Do we have all the information? No. Do we, uh, you know, are we learning more every day, integrating more women into studying folk? Yes, we are, but let's not wait until it's perfect. There is a world of information out there through health experts. Once you learn that and you have that grasp, then you can understand what tools you access. And this is my, you know, because I I look a lot at the femtech market and what's happening today. And there is a lot of support coming to women and from devices to apps to different things. But again, it's, that's a great second step. (laughs) You know, the first step is understanding. It's like in your book and what you do, you know, on your platform, it's explaining it. And then look, here are your options. And I think that that's what we need to keep in mind because you know tracking your uh, symptoms is great but if you don't understand where they come from you don't actually you know well, you, you, it just looks bad on paper <laughs> well it's right? un- understanding the why that's our thing yeah, understanding we wanna, the why. exactly and then it's our job to show women the how you know Absolutely. right and that's what we're going for and and i just would add on the fact that Giving that type of support and education in any health issue can definitely lessen the burden because mm-hmm. it takes, it re- reduces the emotional and mental wellness sort of like toll that like sometimes is the thing that stops us in our tracks, right? We are coming to the end of our time. I'm a bit conscious of that, but while I'm conscious of the time, can you quickly talk about the subconscious, right? So I'd like to sort of like end on you talking a little bit about, you know, what does stick in our subconscious and what triggers us. And then segue that into how OM can potentially help women or anybody listening, because I really would like people to head over and see the work you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So look, it's just about empowering consumers to understand how to navigate What's existing? Exactly. As we said before, it's not about turning your back to you're going to be exposed to it. But let's understand what's out there today. And what's out there today first is the first place you go for health information is online. Right. So let's look at what's happening online. One, the way platforms work online is to try to build clickbait headlines. Right. They try to build a headline that you click on. Now, how do you build a headline that you get consumers to click on? You have two ways. I either have a positive spin to it or I add a negative spin to it. If you add a negative spin to it, it's going to, you're going to have a lot more reactions than the positive because our subconscious mind is trained to keep us alive. So it's trained to identify dangers and to focus on them. So most headlines try to get you in there by taking a health subject and, you know, scaring you (laughs) to begin. You click on it, right? Then you go and you read the article. And in that, again, they're trying to prove a point. So when you're trying to prove a point, you take whatever the study is and you skew the information towards that. And so now I know that consumers are saying things uh, are becoming more aware of this. And I see, you know, sometimes in the press, they're like a big study with 3000 people said this, but I'll take one, one recent headline, maybe not super recent, maybe about eight months ago, but it was a study came out that said that um, actually metabolism doesn't peak until after 60. So if you're gaining weight in your midlife, it's because you have, you're not eating right. And everybody's like, stop using every headline, CNN, you name it, was like, stop blaming midlife for your fat gain. <laughs> right? And then the article was went on to, to talk about that. When the the study itself actually was a lot more nuanced than that, right? And it talked about hormones and it talked about, you know, differences between sexes, men and females and everything. But 
that's not how it was portrayed. And again, you read that article over and over and you're like, oh, my midlife weight gain is, you know, because I- my fault. It's my, my fault. fault. That's exactly so, it. Yeah. Yeah. So be informed, right? Like that's they're there. They're, when you look at it, it's done in a negative way because it makes you click on it. Then even if once you're reading it, they're like in this study that did that and said, because now, you know, they're trying to look legitimate, I would say. To keep you there, they still need to overly sensationalize, you know, the, the Yeah, content. and I know that study inside out, the Ponce study, it's so great. Yeah. It actually was one of those studies that I was like, there's a lot of really good information that we can work here, but with here, but it was cherry picked to the extremes and skewed to people's bias, exactly like yeah. you said. Yeah. yeah. So there is that. Then the second thing coming from a person who was, you know, working again in a product space. Everything that you see is paid advertising. <laughs> so what I mean by that is it's two things. I used to work so for fashion and jewelry brands, but you can apply this to it to everything. We would work with magazines and we'd say, look, we invested a hundred thousand with you. We want a hundred thousand equivalent of editorial. Editorial is non-paid advertising. And they would have to give it because otherwise we would put pressure on them and say, I'm pulling my ads. So You'd see the ads and then you see editorials that kind of look like that. That's why the online community and the bloggers became so big as they did, because for a minute they were neutral. For a minute they had, a, you know, a differentiated and unbiased point of view. But then the brands with their money said, OK, well, we can put it off in print or we can put it online. And that now they're funneling this money into key opinion leaders online where they do and don't have to state you know, that they're sponsored by a company. So keep that in mind. So that's one. The second thing is there's so many advertorials, which is you're basically buying an ad, but it looks like a newspaper article, a magazine article. And good luck trying to find that that's actually paid sponsorship because they always have like a little code somewhere <laughs> that you really need to look at. And that's just like me, for example, talking about how great, you know, <laughs> precision medicine is and I and I buy that space and I you know I discuss it so that's how it works three which is the thing that I discovered recently as I started the company is awards <laughs> now started with Forbes 40 under 40 and you know the big magazines doing awards that's one thing but now everybody's doing awards right so they're like oh congratulations you are win this award for being part of you know, supporting women something. If you want to claim your award, pay $3,000. And then with that $3,000, you get featured, you get part of a list, be made part of a list. And so even... Oh, that's happened to me too. They, I, they've they approached me so many times. Yeah. 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 And I'm, now I'm like, well, I'm not even in that space, but okay. <laughs> Yeah. So no, no, but look, I mean, of course, in everything, there's things that are legitimate. There are things that are not, but to mimicking the codes that we think are legitimate to look legitimate from, yeah. you know, editorials to, you know, to people putting on doctor's codes and stethoscopes, quite frankly, right? I know there's people that make fun of that sometimes, right? They put that in. So visually, we are like, oh, look, it's, you know, health expert talking to advertorials to awards, right? So it, just keep in mind that that's happening. <laughs> but I actually, even just going back to the first point, the you know, they have an opportunity to do positive or negative, like clickbait headlines. And the negative is what sucks us in. And it sucks us in because we probably re relate to it. But also, like you say, it's just our key in a survival instinct that goes, OK, OK, I have to be aware of this. This, you know, this is what's going to happen to me. And so, yeah, it's that they're really great tip for people to sort of keep an eye out. Listen, so tell us a bit about how people can find OM, how they can utilize the, the information and support and education that you provided. What's the best way? So two ways that we're working today. One is with companies to bring the support that we have inside companies. So if you'd like your company to work with us and provide yourselves and other in your teammates with support coming from the best health experts across the world on 
any health matter that's relevant, including sensitive ones like pregnancy loss, let's say anxiety, brain fog, you know, we kind of cover the whole spectrum. Reach out to us. I'd be more than happy to to work with your teams internally. And then we have everything also available on our website, omexperts.com where people can go. And there's two things when it comes to any health matter. It's understanding what that health matter is, but also who the health expert is that you need to go to support for that. And of course, I'm not there yet to push, you know, visibility towards all the different health subjects in a meaningful way. And we're going to get to that. But, you know, you're struggling through, again, a pregnancy loss. Many countries are now offering, you know, like a week off or something. But, you know, there's something you can do about it. There's something you can do about it to support your mental health or, you know, process it in the right, not in the right way, to process it so it doesn't come back in negative ways. There's things you can do to understand what your body went through and to support it in its healing. So for every, you know, everything that every issue, I would say, or every health matter, it's good to understand what tools there are for you to heal and what type of experts support in that health matter. That's great. And so that's all on the OM Experts website, yeah, which that's will right. which will be in the show notes anyway. So what's next? What's exciting and what's coming up for the company and you? So and what's then- next and what I'm building towards is I would love to have, for example, your masterclass and all of the other 140 masterclasses and growing today available on a streamable hub. And this is what we're moving towards because as much as it's great to bring support and visibility to health matters inside companies, many of the subjects that the employees are struggling with are private, right? And they want to engage with that privately. And that's where it really makes a difference. So I think, you know, coming in with health experts and raising visibility towards issues supporting top line management is one thing. The second thing is having employees access support and information in their own time on the matters that they're struggling with. And that's what we're moving towards. Yeah, on their own terms. I love it because there is, there's always an opportunity like for women or men as well in, in your company though to like not pursue it further because of the sensitivity of the topic. And we've all got our different comfort levels. So I think that would be great if that was something that was available to them. Listen, thank you so much for coming on. I very much appreciate the work you're doing. Good luck with everything moving forward. And thanks thank again. And, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. I, I love your social media. I loved your book. I love everything that you're doing. So thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we're, I think we're kindred. Experts, right? Yeah, thanks to all the experts for sure. Okay, take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you like what you hear, then why not subscribe to this podcast and leave me a review? You see, when you do this, it helps to raise the profile of my show and attract new listeners. And it also allows me to continue to deliver valuable content with great guests. And in return for you doing that, I will send you my 12-week core-focused program called Abs on Fire as a thank you. Simply drop me an email at amanda at amanda steve.com and I'll wing that your way. Bye.